Um, so, and then the last one we've done before, which I'm not super worried about. Um, oops, so it's the do, 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 do. Um, Hark the Herald. Okay. You mean you've done it before like a year ago? Yeah, like a year ago. <laughs> How about this? How about this? Uh-huh. The YouTube on this. Yes, correct, 100%, aside from like we go straight into Newborn King as if like they hold it out, I think. So okay. it'll be... Uh, let, me just, let me just see if I can remember what it was. Do, 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 do. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, so <coughs> it's... So it's like one, two, three, do. <laughs> Probably. It five. sounds whatever you just did is fine. <laughs> and then we do that at the end, so it's um I guess it's that. So okay. he does like glory to the newborn. But we're not doing that. We're doing to the newborn. We're going to be what? Oh, oh, we're doing the Advent Refrain, too, and apparently we were supposed to read a reading. They don't have it for us, so we're just going to read it off screen. Or, um, would you like to, if it's on my phone, you can read it off my phone. Because it just records my it. screen a lot when it's time for me to read it, so it's fine. That's true, I might be able to. I can pull it up on my phone. I on the, on the planning center? Because, you know, Elaine it. even sent it to us, so I can pull it up oh, on my yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah, that's I'll a do good that. idea. Sometimes I save it as a photo, just in yeah, case the internet good, goes that's down. That's a good plan. <laughs> Okay, which I need to look at. Yeah, but okay. we're going to read, I mean, we're like right up here. And okay, I hope our children don't go completely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them that service is basically starting. Did Tyra get injured? I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> How could that happen?
Good morning. And peace and grace to you on this day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to dispel a few rumors. There's lots of stories going around about how I hurt my leg. What it really was, was a baptism gone awry. That kid just put up a fight. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. I was standing, this is to clarify all the merry rumors. I was standing on the fence at my house trying to hang Christmas lights. I turned around and said, guys, watch out. I'm jumping down. And it, I, miss, I underestimated my age when I jumped down. It was too high, and I hurt my leg. I didn't fall. There was no amazing rescues. I was just jumping off a fence. That's all it was. But no break. Just, it's fine. So now all the rumors can be put to bed. Um, it's great to see you all here this morning for the second Sunday in Advent. We've got some special new music this morning that I'm really excited to listen to. Um, the adult education continues in the fellowship hall with Chris Hasegawa talking about sacred music. Uh, I have to tell you, last week I got more positive comments about that class than any class I've ever taught. Uh, so, yeah, I hope you get over there. Each class kind of stands alone. If you missed it last week, it doesn't matter. Go check it out. Of course, kids and youth uh, will be in Sunday school between services. So hang out for that. Um, elders and deacons, don't forget, it's our annual joint elder deacon meeting this Sunday after the second service. It's required by the Book of Order, but it'll be really casual. Um, just gonna hang out together, have some desserts and finger foods, and uh, we'll be introducing our proposal for the new church mission statement. So deacons and elders, you will want to be a part of that so you can hear that. Um, and I think there is a minute from Mission Dorothy. Good morning. The theme for this season is, how does a weary world rejoice? Well, I want you all to take a moment to rejoice in knowing that you have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly all this year without perhaps even knowing your impact, both here, locally, and abroad. Out of your donations to the church budget this year, you have given to Outreach, which are our local groups that we sponsor, $35,500. Now, who are these groups? Look up here. More than half of this budget goes to iHelp to support and provide shelter to men and women who are unhoused. Other groups are, as you see on the slide. You also raised $650 for the new family shelter, Schumann House, at the recent gift fair. Schumann House is added to our 2024 budget. So, well done. But we're not finished. To Mission, which are the out-of-the-country overseas groups that we support, we gave 37, or you gave, $37,000. And as you can see here, a quarter of this goes to three mission workers um, in various parts of the world. Other groups are, as you see on the slide. So, well done. But we're not finished yet. We've come to you when disasters happen or there's a special need. And again, you rise to the call. At the beginning of this year, we had disastrous floods close by here in Pajaro. And you gave $16,000 towards that. Amigos de Guadalupe, the Center for Justice and Empowerment in San Jose, which helps with newly arrived immigrants, we co-sponsored a grant from our presbytery for $6,000. The Maui fires. Thanks to our recent successful gift fair, you gave $4,000 to a church in Maui, which has become a much needed source of support for the local community. Angel Tree. <laughs> Right now, we've received gifts and books for 100 students at an after-school program in Seaside. I can tell you that these kids are going to be so excited on Wednesday when they see their gifts. And a big shout out to our youth group who helped with the coordination of this. None of this includes the countless hours, the countless volunteer hours that you spend working with many of these groups. 
you not only talk the talk, but you walk the walk. Thanks be to God for all of you, so rejoice. Please join us in the Advent wreath reading that you see on the screen. How does a weary world practice peace? By, By listening before, before we speak and, and saying sorry when we need to. to. By advocating for justice and caring for our neighbor. By practicing Sabbath and forgiving 70 times 7. By choosing grace over hate and opening the door for each other. There are a million ways to practice peace. So today we light the candle of peace as a reminder and a charge. With, With God's, God's help, may, may we bring peace into a weary world. world. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us this morning as we sing in worship to our great God.
Family of faith, one of the ways we find joy in a weary world is through connection. The prayer of confession is a place of connection with God. And the prayer of confession, we get to come before God with our full, messy, honest selves. And in the midst of that mess, God tells us that we are loved, that we are claimed, that we are forgiven. And there's no greater joy than that. So join me in the prayer of confession, not because you have to, but because you can. Let us connect with God responsively. God of laughter, God of open front doors and family reunions, we confess that we often doubt good news. We move through the world waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for our humanity to get the best of us. Instead of leaning into joy, we lean into scarcity. We lean into fear. We lean into isolation. Forgive us for forgetting that joy is amplified when shared. Heal the wounds we have from past hurts and teach us how to throw open our doors like Elizabeth. Show us how to find joy in connection. I imagine that when we come before God with the truth of our lives, God meets us like Elizabeth meets Mary in the scripture from this morning. The doors thrown open. There is laughter, there's joy, there's singing, there's embracing, and it is holy. So trust this. Believe this. You are claimed. You are loved. You are forgiven. Find joy in this. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Share that peace now one with another. And I, I invite you now to have a seat, uh, unless you're a kid. And then I know Miss Linda would love to spend a moment with you up here on the steps. Come on down, kids. sit by me. Hi, Hazel. I'm glad you brought buddies with you. Good. All right. Last week, we began celebrating the season of Advent. Leading up to Christmas, there are four weeks of Advent, which help us get ready for the arrival of Jesus. One of the ways we celebrate is to light the candles. Some of you helped light the candles this morning, right? We How many candles did we light? Does anybody know? 
Now we have how many candles? Two, that's right, because this is the second Sunday of Advent. So we've lit two candles. We light one for every Sunday in Advent, and then one more for Christmas Day. When we have all of the candles on the wreath lit, it will be Christmas, and our waiting will be over. But it's hard to be patient, isn't it? Raise your hand if you've ever been so excited about something that you couldn't sleep. Yeah, me too. Stand up if you've ever stood in front of a window watching and waiting for someone to come to your home. Have you ever done that, looked out the window? <gasps> Sit down and pretend to sleep. If you've ever fallen asleep waiting for someone or something, it's not that easy to wait. What can we do to help us wait for the coming of Christmas? Well, we can look forward to lighting the candle each week. We can decorate our sanctuary. Did you look around and see the beautiful decorations and decorations in Fellowship Hall? Some of us might have an Advent calendar at home. Do you have an Advent calendar at home with something to do every day? <gasps> a chocolate one. A chocolate one. Ooh. I have a boy one. All right. Very good. So that helps us so that we have some, that helps us with something to do. And Dorothy was telling us this morning about the toys that we bought for the children through the angel tree. We are busy looking for gifts to give to others, cards to share with our family. Some of us are rehearsing for a Christmas cantata, while others are preparing a Christmas musical to share. There are so many things to do as we prepare to welcome Jesus into our lives this season. So when you feel tired of waiting, think of something you can do to share the joy of Advent with those around you. Let's pray. I'll pray first, and then you can pray after me. Coming Christ, coming Christ. thank you for coming to live with us. We celebrate your birth and your coming again. Help us to share your good news. Amen. Please join me in a <clears throat> prayer for illumination. <clears throat> Open us, Holy One, to your word and your way. Clear our minds of holiday distractions and busy tasks. Fill our hearts with the humility we need to hear and receive the message you intend for us today. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become le level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together for the mount of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, 
what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Please stand with us as you are comfortable as we sing again.
Sing choirs of angels. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation. Sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God. Glory in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee. Yea, Lord, we greet Thee. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to second reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. We're picking up last week from where we left off last week. You remember uh, that the angel Gabriel had come and uh, predicted an unlikely pregnancy for Elizabeth and her husband. Um, now we continue the story starting at verse 24. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. I mean, think about it. If you were sitting there minding your own business and an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and said, Greetings! I think I'd be a little more than just perplexed. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call him Jesus, he'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for, who, who was, for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. 
Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to Jerusalem, to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Both of the scriptures today talk about connection, which is the overall theme of the day, finding connections. In Isaiah, we encounter the prophet speaking comforting words to a people who are in distress. The Israelites, along with their king, Jehoiakim, have been taken captive by the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, in 597 B.C., They're living in a state of despair and hopelessness. They don't see any light on the horizon. They're they're far from their homeland. They're separated from their temple. They're longing for restoration. Being separated from the temple is huge for them because they understand that they can only worship appropriately in that place. So they're just kind of lost and wondering. And Isaiah's words come to them and they're meant to bring comfort. They're meant to bring an assurance that God hasn't forgotten them, that God's still somehow there in the mix. And so Isaiah prophesies about the eventual return from exile. And this prophecy is supposed to be hopeful. It's supposed to assure them of God's faithfulness, of God's plan for them, God's plan for restoration in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their weariness. Comfort, oh comfort my people says your God. He's trying to offer a little bit of of balm, a little bit of something that will soothe this time. The promise of restoration, the coming of the Lord to the chosen people, it's intended to bring hope and joy. It's a divine connection. And it's a connection that's uh, mirrored in the Gospel of Luke. This anticipation of a fulfillment of a promise is mirrored in the Gospel of Luke where we witness the miraculous news of Elizabeth's pregnancy and the divine encounter between Mary and her cousin Elizabeth. Right, The joy, the connection, the divine fulfillment in these stories reflect the joy found in our connections with one another and with God. These are our sacred moments that we can bring into the everyday. And the truth is that our lives are shaped by connections. As much as I try to deny that, it's about connections. As much as I try to go to the movie theater at 10 a.m. when no one else is around so I can watch a movie by myself. As much as I go to a rotary meeting and sit at a table by myself hoping that all the other tables will fill up. I am reminded every time someone actually sits down that the connection is is life-giving. The connections bring us joy. They they bring us strength. And that's really why, much to my wife's chagrin, I really love social media. She doesn't really like the time that I spend on the screen. But social media and Facebook, it's really important to me. It fosters and keeps alive connections that I've established over many years. Every day, for example, I interact on social media with my sister, Jimmy Ann. Yes, her name is Jimmy Ann. We're from the South. Every day, we compete with each other over the puzzles of the New York Times, the Wordle, and the connection, seeing who can do better. And it's this simple little everyday thing that just gives me joy, right? 
It's a simple connection. And then I keep scrolling and I see what my friends from childhood and high school and, and college are up to. I mean, after all, all my friends and family from that time live on the East Coast. And here I am on the West Coast. But I maintain these connections. And in fact, some of those connections have led me to do weddings from childhood for childhood friends. Mark, would you do this for us? It's an amazing thing. Connections are life. They're real. In the story of Elizabeth and Mary, we witness this beautiful connection between these two women, both chosen by God for unlikely and extraordinary roles. And their meeting, the connection, sparks an exchange of joy, an exchange of affirmation, and of blessing. Elizabeth's child leaps in her womb, recognizing the presence of the Savior within Mary. It's an affirmation not only of family connections, but of divine ones fostered by a God who is about to enter the world and by a God whom we are now waiting for again. Their connection is a reminder that in the midst of weariness, even a little bit of joy multiplies when we share each other's blessings. It's in these connections that God's presence is felt most profoundly. When we share in each other's joys, we become part of a larger narrative of God's love and grace. I'm a bit of an introvert in, in how, it, how I charge my batteries, right? I need alone time. There were periods of my life where I would go away every year for a week of solitude at a Jesuit monastery near me. And I would get recharged and I would feel really good about it. But you know what? At the end of every week, by the time Thursday and Friday started to roll around, I was missing my family. I was missing my community. I was missing my church. I couldn't stay there. As much as it charged me, the life was in the connections I returned to. It was a part of that larger narrative of God's love and grace. And we relieve the weariness that we hold by carrying it together. Here was Elizabeth, whose husband hadn't been able to speak since the angel Gabriel brought his message of hope. Now, you could debate whether that was really a burden for her or not, but I'd argue that it was. And here's Mary, a pregnant teenager, with no husband, no one to share the beautiful news with, with embarrassment and I imagine a fair bit of anxiety and then they find each other and the connection sustains them and the weariness fades if only for just that moment and it's yet it's not always that simple is it Connections aren't always easy. In our lives, maybe we encounter brokenness, distances, strained relationships, financial concerns weigh heavy on our hearts, especially this time of year. And it comes together and it can have the cumulative effect of magnifying what other, whatever gaps there are, whatever chinks there are in the chains of connections. And of course, at this time of year, those tensions are probably more heavily felt, right? I mean, all the most funny, best Christmas movies are about families that are struggling with those connections, right? They're, they're arguing, they're not comfortable, it's awkward, and it all comes to a hilarious head, and then they figure out the connections. But this time of year, a lot of times, we're just weary. Corey talked about it last week, carrying packages, carrying burdens, weary of hearing Mariah Carey yet Again for the 6,000th time. But just as Isaiah proclaimed comfort to a distressed people, we're reminded that God offers us comfort and restoration. God is, is totally in the mix if we'll take a moment and look around. And what I love about this reminder from Isaiah and from the gospel is, is it's not a Pollyannish sentiment, right? It's, it's not a simple sentiment. It's not a person in a place of privilege with no real burden telling someone else to just be of good cheer. It's going to be okay, right? These are people with real issues. I remember a great old Charlie Brown cartoon, Snoopy sitting out in the cold as the snow falls and he's shivering and Charlie Brown and Linus walk by in luxuriously warm fur coats and hats. And Linus says, look at Snoopy over there. We really ought to do something. And so they walk over to Snoopy and Charlie Brown leans down and says, be of good cheer, Snoopy. 
And Linus says, yes, be of good cheer. And then they walk away, happy with their efforts, as Snoopy remains cold in the snow, looking after them. But that's not Isaiah, is it? That's not Mary and Elizabeth. They're not caught up in luxurious fur. They are a people, the Israelites, under siege, captive in a foreign land and far from home. They're forcibly removed from their homeland, their city in ruins, their temple destroyed, their lives shattered. And the words of the prophet Isaiah come to that moment like a beacon of hope, piercing through the darkness of their despair, reminding of the connections they have to the community, to the land, to their God. Imagine if you were them being uprooted from your homes, your community torn apart, your connection to God's promise severed because you can't get to church. This was the reality for the exiled Israelites, a reality that spoke of shattered dreams, a deep longing for restoration of the most important connections in life. And in the midst of their anguish, Isaiah comes and proclaims a message of comfort. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. It's a, a covenant promise of restoration, a reminder of what God had been doing for all of these years since the garden, a reassurance that their exile is not the, the end of the story. There's yet more to come. God hasn't abandoned them. He was with them in their pain, preparing a way for their return, preparing a way for their restoration, a way that would come to fruition through Mary. The message resonates with us today. I mean, just as the Israelites long for connection to their homeland, to their God, we also seek connections in our lives. In the Gospel of Luke, we witness the joyous connection between Elizabeth and Mary, two women chosen by God for extraordinary roles and, and craving support and connection that they, they weren't really finding around them. And this encounter is one of mutual support, of affirmation, of a shared joy. Mary's visit to Elizabeth brings a profound sense of connection and recognition of the miraculous work of God even within them. The, they even sing a, a joyful hymn, so moved are they, in the midst of what would have been totally overwhelming for the rest of us. And that idea... The thought of a God on the way, a God already in some sense in their midst, it sustains them. And they survive and they rebuild. And from them, a Savior comes to us in fulfillment of Isaiah's promises to take the weariness. What was it that Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. It's not an individual, it's not a statement of individual movement. Come to me, all of you. It's a statement about the connections between each of us and between our God who is on the way. Connections. When I was in elementary school in the last century, I just like saying that because it feels... There was this kid in my class. His name was Gerald Evans. And we, we called him Ditto for some reason. I don't really remember why we called him Ditto. I imagine it's because he looked a lot like his father, but I don't know. But Ditto got real sick. And the family wasn't in a position to really care for him because money was so tight. It must have been about 1977 or 78 when you could have spent your whole paycheck on a, on a gas tank and cars were lined up around the blocks. My mom talked with some of the other moms and it's interesting, people really knew all their neighbors back then. They, they actually knew them, and they knew their history. They were, they were connected. I read this book, um, Bowling Alone, and it talks about the shift in American culture when we went from sitting on our front porch, talking to our neighbors walking by, uh, to the new reality of fenced-in backyards with decks where we don't see our neighbors anymore as we barbecue. But back then, people really knew all of their neighbors. We knew everyone on the block and everyone for several blocks. And we knew who was hurting and we knew who needed their driveway shoveled, their leaves raked. We were connected. And in that moment, quietly, 
a little manila envelope started being passed from mailbox to mailbox. And people placed cash in the envelope. And no one took it in and failed to pass it on to the next mailbox. And there was no letter telling them what this was for because everyone knew. Everyone was connected by school, by community, by churches and faith. And the envelope found its way to the mailbox of Ditto's family down by the Schuylkill River. And they were sustained. As much by the connections that produced the envelope as by the money that eventually filled it. And it happened without GoFundMe or the viral nature of a social media post. And I don't know if anyone ever knew that my mom started it and she would have been embarrassed if anyone did. But connections, deep connections made it possible to bear the weariness of that family together over a holiday season that must have seemed pretty dark for them at first. Recently, just this past year, Ditto, my age, passed away from a, a heart condition. And the connections were still there, and the community reached out again. And I'm told that a modern version of that envelope passed again, and the family was so able to give him the celebration of life that he deserved because of those connections. But you know, it's not always that grand of a story. Miracles happen in small, everyday ways as well. Even in our own church campus sometimes. Last week on Tuesday night, a group of us gathered in the workroom in the church office back where the, the copiers are. You know, one of the last things Pastor Jay charged me with was creating a mission statement for the church that was Christocentric. There in the hospital, he said, it's a good mission statement, but it needs to have Jesus in it. It needs that so that it can remind us why we do what we do. And Tuesday night, we gathered and worked through our edits, and really, within a half an hour or less, we were actually done with the work of writing a new mission statement. We finished in half an hour what we'd been thinking about for two years. Because of COVID, we'd never been face-to-face -face in our group. We'd been passing emails back and forth, and really, emails are no way to craft a mission statement. But face to face, those connections breathing in the same room, we finished quickly and then shared our own stories and insights over a fine pot pie provided by Ellen Tucker. And let me tell you, that was a really good pot pie. But the thing is, it was that connection, that flesh and blood connection that made it possible sitting there eye to eye and shoulder to shoulder, just as it made it possible for the children of Israel to find hope in the midst of exile, just as it helped an old woman and a teenager find sustenance and support in the midst of two very surprising pregnancies. Connections are vital. They're vital in our lives. We can't do without them. They bring us joy, strength, and a sense of belonging. They are vital. I've been saying to Presbytery leadership, you know, there's no reason why I should ever have to drive two hours for a meeting again because of Zoom and hybrid meetings. And then I see this and I realize, yes, there are plenty of good reasons for me to drive two hours to be in a meeting face-to-face -face with my colleagues. Relationships aren't about efficiency. And they rarely are efficient. Life often fractures these connections. We face exiles in different forms, separation from loved ones, broken relationships, a, a sense of spiritual disconnect. The beauty of Advent lies in the promise of restoration and connection. Just as God promised the Israelites restoration from exile, God promises restoration to us. The season invites us to rekindle, rekindle connections. It's why the Sundays leading up to Christmas are usually some of the fullest, because people instinctively understand the need to reconnect and show up. To rekindle, rekindle connections with God, with one another, and even with our inner selves. So I guess... My encouragement, my admonition, my exhortation this Sunday and for this Advent season is that we actively seek out restoration through those connections. 
Let us repair what is broken, reconcile where there is division, and reach out in love and support to those around us. It will make a difference. This past week, I went to a luncheon at Compass Church. Compass Church is a, used to be First Pres Salinas, and they left our church for uh, the, a, a different Presbyterian denomination. And I thought that relationship was broken and we were just going to do different things. But they have new leadership and they're looking for a way to partner with other churches. And it was really a beautiful moment of, I mean, Salvation Army was there, Methodists were there, Episcopalians were there, Presbyter two, two Presbyterians were there. So it was a really good meeting. What would it look like to restore that relationship? Sure, we believe some different things, but we all believe in Jesus. So we reconcile where there's division. We reach out in love and support to those around us. And in doing so, we find that no burden is too heavy. And we will feel the weariness fade and the strength will gather. Amen. I want to invite you for a moment uh, to consider generosity and to consider uh, giving of your gifts, whatever that looks like for you, whether it is in the presentation of beautiful music for God's people, whether it is financially, whether it's showing up to help spread mulch on a, a garden on a Saturday morning, whatever that looks like. Consider generosity. The plates are going to pass, and uh, if it's a good morning to give something, please do, but only if you can do it cheerfully. Because we're told in scripture that God loves a cheerful giver. I'm just going to introduce this song real quick. Um, and I guess tie it to what Mark had to say this, this morning. Uh, we had last week, Corey mentioned, you know, that not every Christmas is pleasant, right? It, there's, they have, we have the blue Christmas service um, often at our church. And, um, you know, and, and just talking about Mark's connections. Uh, last year, uh, I lost my brother and suddenly, and he, he passed away. And it was a really hard Christmas for me, for my family, um, and especially right after it had happened, many, many of you from the church stepped up and just, you know, brought us meals. I, I'm the cook in our family, and I did not feel like cooking at all for about a month, I would say. And even after I, after that, I still didn't want to, but, it, you know, got to feed the family. <laughs> but for a while, it was just like, you all stepped up and helped my family so much. Anyways, this song is kind of about Christmas time and uh, needing the, the wonderful counselor to help bring us peace in the midst of even those times of sadness. <laughs> Jesus, can you make this season 
told us he'd be no stranger to all our sorrow and all the hurt we'll ever know. And so let these gifts remind us how love came down to find us, the wonder of the ages, the life, the truth, the way he is our wonder. pray with me. God of today and God of tomorrow, we come to you this morning to thank you for the way that joy binds us to con together and connects us. Thank you for contagious laughter and inside jokes, for stories around dinner tables that make us laugh until we cry. Thank you for comedy shows, for the familiar sound of a loved one's chuckle, and for the universality of smile lines. What a gift you've given us, Lord. The text today reminds us that joy is better when shared. So today we thank you in particular for the Elizabeths and the Marys in our lives. Thank you for the people who spark joy in us. Thank you for the people who pull us out of our shells, who teach us how to dance and show us how to laugh. Thank you for those who declare, blessed are you. In a moment of gratitude, we silently lift their names before you now. Holy God, although we know that joy is better when shared, there are days when it's easier said than done. Like Elizabeth, who stayed in isolation for months after receiving good news, we too have a tendency to choose fear over joy. Without the help of someone at our door, we can often keep our joy to ourselves. So gracious God, when those days come, when the waters of fear rise, when isolation steals our joy, comfort us. Comfort us like a shepherd with a flock. Gather us into your arms and carry us to safer ground that we might experience joy in the ways you have in store for us. And until that promised day, like Mary and Elizabeth, we'll do our best to keep finding one another. Like Mary and Elizabeth, we will do our best to open the door to one another, to you, and to the joy that connection brings. Together, we unite our voices in hope praying the words your son taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, Give us this day our daily bread. 
daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing one last song together. And um, yeah, just real quick about that song too. My wife was the one that found it last year, right around the time that we really needed it. And uh, so thanks for letting us share that with you this morning. are life. Go out and make some connections like kids hanging out with their best friends. Make some connections this week and you will be restored and uh, the weariness will fade. And now may our God, the heat behind a million stars and the power behind a thousand storms be with us and those we love and those Jesus calls us to love now and forevermore. Amen.